online on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. This is GB News with me, Alex Phillips. Telegraph political editor Christopher Hope will join me as Europe braces itself for more bloody days ahead. We get the latest from Kiev, a city that could soon be under siege. Barbaric. The words of Prime Minister Boris Johnson as more reports circulate of indiscriminate attacks against civilians using internationally banned weapons. What's in Putin's arsenal and what happens if he uses it? As we continue our coverage of the war in Ukraine, you can contribute by email using the address gbviews at gbnews.uk or follow our updates on Twitter at gbnews. Good afternoon. It's one minute past two. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. The UK has stepped up sanctions against Russia, banning now all ships with any connection to the country from entering British ports. The Prime Minister's just arrived in Estonia after meeting his counterpart in Poland. Boris Johnson says there is an unfolding disaster in Europe and President Putin has made a colossal mistake by invading Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is prepared to use barbaric and indiscriminate tactics against innocent civilians to bomb uh, tower blocks, to send missiles into tower blocks uh, to kill uh, children, uh, as we're seeing in increasing numbers. Ukraine has been facing another day of heavy bombardment. The Foreign Ministry has released a video showing a missile hitting a government building in Kharkiv this morning. The Interior Ministry says at least 10 people have been killed, 35 wounded in rocket strikes by Russian forces in the city today. Satellite images show a Russian military convoy stretching from estimated 40 miles northwest of the capital, Kyiv. Craters can also be seen at a military airbase in the city and an oil terminal was damaged after being hit by Russian missiles. The chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court says he'll open an investigation into possible war crimes. Amnesty International says cluster bombs hit a nursery last week and Ukraine's ambassador to the US says Russia has used vacuum bombs. Both are banned under the Geneva Convention. In an address to the European Parliament, Ukraine's president accused Russia of targeting civilians. Nobody's going to break us. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. We want our children to live. It seems to me that is fair. Yesterday, 16 children died. And again, President Putin will say that this is an operation and we are beating the military infrastructure. Where are our children? What military factories do they work at? On which rockets? Maybe they ride in tanks. There was a mass walkout from the UN Human Rights Council as the Russian foreign minister began speaking. Diplomats and ambassadors left the room as a video message from Sergei Lavrov began to play at the conference on disarmament. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says his statement was full of disinformation and didn't deserve their attention. Lavrov had been unable to travel to Geneva in person because of the EU ban on Russian flights. He criticised European and UK sanctions against his country. Members of the European Union have chosen a unilateral path of illegitimate sanctions, using them to evade a direct, honest, face-to-face -face dialogue, which they clearly apprehend. The situation in the world is not getting any easier. It is deteriorating. The main reason for this is that the U.S. and its allies continue to aggressively impose the so-called rules-based world order. Here, Ukraine's ambassador to the U.K. has warned that Russia could try to starve residents in major cities in an attempt to win the war. Vladimir Pushtaiko told the parliamentary committee that President Putin didn't expect such strong resistance. People are throwing the Molotov cocktails from their car, passing by Russian tanks. So all of, all of this, you know, all, all hands-on 
support and and and, and uh, resilience is going so much against his plans and people are in russia themselves start asking questions what are we doing there and why the sporting world's been reacting to the invasion. Adidas was the latest to cut ties, suspending its partnership with the Russian Football Union with immediate effect. That's after FIFA and UEFA have suspended the country from all their football competitions. UEFA has also ended its sponsorship deal with the Russian energy company Gazprom, which was worth £34 million a season. In other news now, a British fugitive who's been on the run for nearly a decade has been arrested in Spain. Sarah Panitske is accused of laundering £1 billion as part of a mobile phone tax fraud. She was picked up while walking her dogs in the coastal city of Tarragona. The Queen has held her first virtual audiences since testing positive with coronavirus. The head of state met with the ambassadors from Andorra and Chad via video link from Windsor Castle. It's after the monarch was forced to postpone her engagements last week. You're now up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now, back to Alex for We Need to Talk About. Another tower block raised to the ground by missiles in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second city. This time, a government building but reports continue to emerge of Russian forces increasingly targeting civilian areas. The death toll is unknown, but it is predicted to be in the hundreds, including many children. Earlier today, Prime Minister Boris Johnson was in Warsaw, where he was forced to defend the UK's refusal to create a no-fly zone, warning that it could escalate into Britain, being directly dragged into the conflict. At the same time, he spoke of intelligence reports that the Russian military had resorted to using internationally outlawed cluster bombs, while thermobaric missiles have been reportedly cited being transited into the war zone, designed to have devastating effects. Meanwhile, a 40-mile-long convoy of Russian artillery ominously closes in on Kiev, as civilians hide in bomb shelters, basements and metro stations, preparing for the worst. The fears today are that Russian troops could deploy medieval siege tactics, strangulating cities by cutting off vital supplies, starving the population to death. The might of Russia's military is now perilously close to the capital, as blood-red demarcations show the areas already in the grip of Putin's troops, constricting the country in a vice-like grip from inside out, closing off its borders as desperate Ukrainians continue to try to flee. Women and children waiting for days to cross into safe countries as men are told to stay and fight. Well, our home and security editor, Mark White, joins us now. Mark, what is the latest that you're hearing from the ground in, um, in Kiev? Well, some very worrying reports coming from some key cities, particularly, I think, Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, which has been the subject of some intense bombing throughout the morning. In particular, that administrative headquarters right in the centre of Kharkiv in Freedom Square, which was the subject of this missile attack. Uh, at 8 o'clock this morning, the timestamp on the pictures gives it away, just uh, 8.01 and 50-odd seconds on the 1st of the 3rd, so the 1st of March, today's date. When these images came in in the morning, clearly uh, uh, it was a shocking sight, and we knew that there would be clearly casualties with regard to that. We're inside the, the building showing out into Freedom Square at the moment, the devastation, rubble-strewn Freedom Square, and inside it's utterly obliterated. Well, a number of people, uh, upwards of at least 10, have been killed, we understand, in this missile strike. 20 or so have been injured. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, at um, the administrative headquarters also, there was, uh, we're told, either missile strikes, 
shelling or a combination of both taking place in residential areas across Kharkiv. But the images from outside the government building really give an indication of just how significant that blast was. Not a single window in that headquarters building, it seems, is intact. Uh, and the square itself, normally the roadways around the square uh, were full of traffic. I mean, it was quieter, thankfully, than normal because of the fact that we are That's in the middle of a conflict. Um, in terms of the progress of the Russian, uh, Russian forces, the progress of the Russian forces is, according to our own Ministry of Defence in the UK, uh, somewhat slowed. Uh, there is uh, aerial footage, satellite imagery that's come out that showed the main armoured division, which was a few miles long, now some 40 miles long. I think that's probably uh, in part due to the fact that uh, for a while there were three abreast these vehicles, which include tanks, armoured personnel carriers, other troop carriers, fuel trucks, uh, ammunition and logistics trucks. Uh, they've now kind of, for the most part, gone into single file. They're making their way down towards the capital, Kiev, and according to UK intelligence officials, US intelligence officials, they believe that the plan is to encircle the capital city and potentially other um, uh, cities as well. Now, whether it's to put that city in a stranglehold or then to move on and invade, we don't know exactly what the calculus is. But the map of the region shows just the Russian gains so far. And according to defence officials, intelligence officials in the West, Russia has not made the kind of advances that intelligence officials certainly thought uh, that the Russians were aiming to do to begin with. You can see down in Crimea on the bottom, they've come uh, up about uh, a couple of hundred miles to the south of Ukraine and the west, Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, they have gained territory up uh, towards Kharkiv, where we were showing that missile strike, uh, and then Kiev itself. Uh, the map going in on Kiev, there was intense and still intense fighting around Cherniv, about 100 miles or so north of Kiev, and the Chernobyl nuclear power station, the scene of that 1986 disaster, uh, has been taken over by Russian forces, and that was to allow the Russian forces the most direct access down to Kiev. But, as I say, that advance on Kiev slowed significantly, and the move that everybody expects is the encirclement of Kiev within the coming days. Mark, thank you very much for the update. Well, in the past hour, the Home Secretary has made a statement in the Commons saying how the UK will help Ukrainian refugees. Family members of British nationals resident in the Ukraine who need a UK visa can apply through the temporary location in Lviv or through visa application centres in Poland, Moldova, Romania and Hungary. We have created additional capacity in all locations at pace in anticipation of the invasion of Ukraine. This includes, this includes a pop-up visa application centre in Reservoir in Poland, which has provided total capacity currently of well over 3,000 appointments per week. Well, joining me now is Christopher Hope, Associate Politics Editor at The Daily Telegraph. Christopher, I mean, there are people who are welcoming now, uh, finally, the UK government putting in place what is going to be our refugee policy. But there are those who are saying it does not go far enough. It's different. It's, uh, the, old, the old rules don't apply. It is, it is, it is war in, 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 in Europe. It's a complete nightmare for any kind of n normal policy-making arrangement here. I think, I think it goes far, quite far. I mean, I think Pretty's working now within the kind of confines you can try and work in, but actually should probably go much further, I think, and that's what will be coming in the coming days. And we've had the Prime Minister in Poland in Warsaw today where he's uh, made an address once again outlining our support for Ukraine, but he was under pressure mm. from those who are saying, why is the UK blocking a no fly zone in, in Ukraine. And the question for that emotional journalist there was, what are the alternatives? Well, I understand there are actually some alternatives on, on, on the slate there in Whitehall. One of them could be a safe zone in Western Ukraine that could be protected by the United Nations, the OSCE, maybe 
the European Union, although that might be inflamed further um, by Vladimir Putin, but some way, some corridor some, to get people out of Kiev. You saw on your map there how close the Russian troops are now with that, that red mass that being kept covered over Ukraine. Like, you can only matter of time before it gets near and too near Ukraine for comfort, so to, to near Kiev for comfort. So the hope is that they can get people out into the west of the country. I mean, this is the worry now. In the last hour, there have been renewed uh, reports of fear that there's going to be an imminent airstrike on, on the capital. Um, but, I mean, by creating this buffer zone around or using Ukraine to create a no-fly zone, that has the risk, doesn't it, of dragging NATO into the war? And that just can't happen. Certainly, if you hear Jens Stoltenberg in, uh, in Poland this morning, along with the PM, saying there's no way that Britain can enforce any kind of no-fly zone because of the risk of triggering Article 5. And Article 5 is this idea that when one NATO uh, member States attacked, they all go to their, their aid. That's why the UN might be a better vehicle, but of course there's a veto on the Permanent Security Council membership that Russia have. That could be a problem there. Um, so, but there has to be some form of maybe a safe zone, a buffer zone. But then, of course, if, if Ukraine falls, you could be left with a degree like Germany after the Second World War with long term partition that could go on for years and decades and a new Cold War in Europe. The stakes are so high. I mean, all of the big international organisations out in force today. You've had Liz Truss addressing the um, UNHCR <coughs> in Geneva. You've also had uh, President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky doing a video link live to the European Parliament where he received a standing ovation and lots of parts moving at the moment. Finland saying they want to join NATO. Uh, Zelensky putting pressure on the European Parliament to say we want to join the EU. Let's get this done quickly. I mean, is this sort of building a new mosaic of uh, global memberships the right way forward or is that going to upset Putin more do you think? Things are happening so quickly I mean this time last week we were discussing the end of Covid restrictions it's unbelievable isn't it that there was, there was literally a five hour gap between the end of Covid restrictions in England and then uh, the invasion of, of, uh, of Ukraine about 5am last Thursday and suddenly we're into this whole new paradigm um, yes, things are happening so quickly, as you say. I mean, the, so, the international community has moved so fast, I think, in defence of, of Ukraine, which is to its absolute credit in a way it didn't uh, over Crimea in 2014. And there's been a lot of discussion about historically building up to this point, whether we've appeased Russia too much, whether, in fact, we've essentially funded the procurement of the weapons they're now using against Ukraine with $100 billion a year of trade uh, with Russia. But in, uh, increasingly, we're seeing the international community starting to step away. But there are those still <laughs> pledging their support, like Pakistan and mm. in the shadows a little bit, like China. How should the UK government be addressing those countries who could be accused of aiding and abetting mm. Putin's that despotic regime? We haven't really got there yet. I mean, I think for now it's dealing with front and centre with the, the risk to life in Kiev and, and other cities in Ukraine. And, of course, dealing with Russia and Putin and trying to work out what to do there. That, I, that will carry on behind the scenes. I think the focus is on the people in Ukraine. Over time, though, the behaviour of those other, other countries you mentioned will come under some, under some scrutiny. And we're not even there yet on consumer boycotts in this country of of Russian product, product, not just vodka, but other things too. Where I think there'll be uh, people want to do their own, they want to do their bit to try and show how upset they are about what Russia's done. I mean, Boris Johnson again has been warning about the potential kickback of sanctions that we're placing on Russia onto European economies, including ours, especially with things like energy liabilities. Are we starting to see any indication of that kickback yet? Well, not yet. I mean, don't forget, UK relies on about 3% of gas and, and from Russia. It's not really our problem in the same way it is for Germany, where they got rid of their nuclear programme in the same way as relying ever more on Russian gas, and now they can't have that through this, this North Scope pipeline. So it's a bigger worry for them. Of course, the big concern is that sanctions hurt everybody in Russia, not just the people around Putin who they're targeted at, but I think the hope is, I think for the, for the hope from the, from, the, from the UK government is that it might ferment some concern amongst the generals, the population in Russia, to rise up against Putin. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're at the beginning of a long, a long haul. Yeah, I think you're right, Chris. Thank you ever so much. Well, listen, if you want to contribute to our coverage today, you can email us gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. You are with GB News on TV and radio. It's time today we must face up to the urgent situation. Hello again. Blue skies across the north today, cloudier skies further south. Most of us will be in the cloudier boat tomorrow with rain and drizzle in the west, but it should be another sunny day across northwest Scotland where this area of high pressure will hold on. But down to the south, we've got low pressure and weather fronts which are slowly 
trudging northwards, certainly bringing a wet evening across Devon, Cornwall, uh, much of Hampshire, and that rain extending across parts of southeast England and trickling into South Wales too. That rain will continue to spread into the Midlands also. But northern England northwards staying mostly dry and with clear skies across Scotland. We will see a frost forming pretty quickly here this evening and uh, by dawn. Certainly in rural spots, down to minus three, minus four. Further south, a long way from freezing. Temperatures in Cardiff and London to start Wednesday, six or seven Celsius. But it will be grey, it will be damp. That rain will trickle into parts of northern England, particularly west of the Pennines. Parts of the northeast of England may stay dry. The rain will spread into Northern Ireland, so a very different day here and across North Wales compared to today. Eventually, some of that rain will spread into southwest Scotland, but much of Scotland dry, and again, that far northwest corner staying dry, fine, and pretty sunny. Temperatures in the south quite mild, but not feeling all that mild with the dull and dank weather, which will continue to trickle northwards during the course of the evening, eventually clouding over across the northwest of Scotland. The rain tending to ease off in many areas, but another line of rain pushes into Wales and southwest England as we go into Thursday. And this is a this line of rain is a slow moving weather front which will only very gradually trickle into the Midlands, parts of northern England during the day on Thursday. Should brighten up in Northern Ireland, probably brightening up in Wales and southwest England during the day on Thursday as well and staying largely dry across eastern parts. Again, temperatures in the south double figures, further north, seven, eight or nine Celsius. Goodbye. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Harrowing images of deadly weapons being rolled into Ukraine while Russia taunts the world with nuclear threats have led many to question how far Putin will go when his back is against the ropes. Shells of cluster bombs outlawed by over 100 countries have been seen embedded in pavements, while civilian footage and eyewitness reports suggest what appears to be their use in civilian areas even against schools, in acts likely to amount to war crimes. Lethal thermobaric missiles able to devastate entire blocks and lead to mass casualties through creating a vacuum and an intense pressure wave, rupturing lungs, bursting eardrums and burning victims with intense heat, have been seen transported into Ukraine by Russian missile launchers as fears mount that Putin will resort to more extreme weaponry to turn the tide of war. 
Well, I'm joined by Hans Christensen, who's the director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Thank you so much for being on the show. How concerned are you, A, about Putin's deadly arsenal, and B, about whether he's going to use it? Well, when it comes to nuclear weapons, it's obviously a significant step up uh, because of the horrific consequences of any use. Uh, so it has to be really careful about not rattling that sword too much. That said, he's doing it, and he is uh, doing things that we have not seen uh, being done in Europe on nuclear weapons since the early 1980s. Uh, so this is clearly unprecedented. I mean, Putin has put his uh, nuclear deterrent into a position of readiness, and I, I understand that people aren't entirely sure what that means and whether these are going to be sure. long-range or short-range nuclear weapons. What, what do you read into that situation? Well, it does seem involved something uh, related to uh, their alert level in terms of what, how ready is the system to receive launch orders if necessary. There might also have been some slight adjustments of the submarines, uh, but nothing that amounts to some significant change. And you have to rem remember also, Russia's strategic nuclear forces are normally on alert. So the only thing that would significantly uh, show a difference would be if some of his mobile uh, ICBM launchers would uh, disperse into the landscape or some of the bombers would be equipped with nuclear weapons. Then it would show that there's something significantly different going on. And what is the West's level of preparedness when it comes to the threat of nuclear attack? I mean, are we... Uh, I understand Russia has a huge arsenal. In fact, I think uh, their range of nuclear weapons is the, the, the same as America and the UK's put together. But how are we equipped if, if he did press a button? How are we equipped to actually manage to intercept? Well, so what he's doing, ironically, is not a surprise uh, to nuclear planners because they have been looking at scenarios like this for decades. And so U.S. nuclear posture is, is, and, and the British is geared precisely to be able to deal with the arsenal that Russia has today. Uh, so it's, it's not like you know, they're caught off guard or anything like that. I think the important part is no more uh, don't take uh, Putin's bait here. Uh, don't start escalating to nuclear signaling on the Western side as well, because that could take this crisis to a, a level where uh, there are hor horrific consequences. I mean, Western observers are extremely worried about the sort of weaponry he is actually using currently in uh, Ukraine with these allegations that thermobaric missiles could be used against civilians. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the nature of those weapons, things like cluster bombs, intercontinental ballistic missiles and thermobaric weapons? Well, only, I mean, my expertise is on nuclear weapons issues, so uh, I'm not a co conventional arms uh, expert, but my understanding of, of course, those types of weapons are that they're particularly uh, uh, designed to cause aerial damage, very indiscriminate damage. And so once you launch that into a neighborhood, it lands anywhere and, and, and civilians are caught in the middle of it. And so that's why these are, you know, uh, borderline uh, illegal weapons. And they're basically uh, indiscriminate weapons, indiscriminate destructions of neighborhoods. Putin has previously said he's extremely concerned about the elements of the US global, global, global missile defense system near Russia. I mean, do you think that's a genuine concern? Uh, no, that uh, missile defense system does not have the capability to, uh, to, to take out, so to speak, uh, Russia's nuclear uh, intercontinental arsenal. Um, he's, he's more uh, playing this up because it has some regional uh, potential uh, consequences. Uh, but they've been doing this for, you know, two decades now, uh, complaining about that. Um, and I don't really think that matters except in the rhetoric. Hans Christensen, thank you ever so much for giving us an insight into well, quite what uh, Putin might have stockpiled over the past few decades. That's Hans Christensen, Director of Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. I mean, Christopher, it is horrific. We haven't, you know, the West hasn't been gripped by this panic since the last Cold War. But he made a point there that we must not do anything to... To, to accelerate this panic because it could actually lead to some, well, 
extremely dangerous actions. It's, it's rhetoric so far, isn't it? And we saw that in, Wa in Washington. They've been just, you know, not reacting to what Putin's been saying in that speech at the weekend. I also heard that I think the, uh, the US, of course, monitors what Russia are doing with their nuclear weapons. There's no sign of anything happening there. It's just merely talk by Putin, um, talking to his, uh, his general staff, looking, looking uh, somewhat depressed by what he was telling them in, in, the, in those extraordinary footage there from, from, from the Kremlin. Um, and the hope is that, you know, that, we, we, that it, can, it can dial it down. But, the, you know, this cluster bomb attack yesterday, is, is, if that's the beginning of such similar attacks, then it's going to be so much worse than it is at the moment. And how on earth is the West supposed to counter that? I mean, there's been uh, calls to maybe throw Russia off the UN Security Council, but that council is uh, convened of yeah. people who have some of the biggest stockpiles of nuclear and, and, weapons. And it it's why they are there. It, it can't happen. The only way it can happen is if the UN General Assembly actually vote on it. And the only way they can vote on it is if the, if the Security Council propose it. And, of course, if you're on a Security Council like Russia, you'll veto it. So that there's a kind of, that Russia are locked in as a member of the P5, the members of the Security Council, is not going to happen, they're being chucked off. That's one idea. I and mean, if people are, are looking around for any ideas, the idea of a safe zone I mentioned earlier is a thought, an idea, UN patrol safe zone. You're going towards what France is talking about, a, a neutral Ukraine. That's not what Ukraine wants. I mean, I think, you know, people are just looking for ideas wherever they can come from at the moment. I mean, so in theory, what we're talking about is the idea of creating an off-ramp for Putin. But it's very difficult to know what his next move's going to be. It seems that he is cornered now. The yep. invasion so far is dragging into week two. I think he was expecting uh, more earlier successes. And now there's constant talk of this convoy closing in around Kiev. I think we're about to see some pretty desperate circumstances over the coming days. And why is, and why is he deploying um, cluster bombs on a country he's trying to... And he's, he might think it was liberating it from the way it's being run by the Ukrainian government. So he's trying to go in there and hold the hearts and minds of Ukrainians, but he's attacking them. I mean, it's so going so wrong for him. And it, of course, the pace of, of the progress of that column towards Kiev is so slow as well. It can't be going well for him. And that concern, of course, then is what's next, whether where, where, where it brings in much more serious firepower than what it has at the moment. I mean, we also know that the uh, president of Belarus, Lukashenko, had a snap referendum to turn his country into one that could host nuclear weapons. And now we've currently got Russian nuclear weapons being transited into that country. And we've heard of missiles being fired from that country and Belarusian troops ready to cross the borders and, and, and breach the frontiers of Ukraine. How worried should we be about Belarus joining the fray? I mean, he's always been Putin's bag carrier, yeah. hasn't he? But this does add, uh, you know, a new well, person into I mean, it's priced in. I mean, the Belarusian support for Moscow is priced in. It's what we saw uh, two or three weeks ago when they appeared on the same stage in, in the Kremlin. And we're seeing it now with, with Russian troops moving, moving through Belarus. It's, it's another, a further complication, I think. But it's kind of priced in as, that, as that's what's happening there. Yeah, but also with the idea now that you've got Zelensky saying, let us join the EU, Finland wanting to join NATO, it does seem to me that there's an axis building and teams building up on either side of that axis. Yeah, we are back into the playbook of the, of the early 80s, aren't we? Or even before the 70s, when you have two, two, two uh, sides um, facing off um, with nuclear we weapons at the heart of it. I mean, it's a huge uh, issue. I can see Ukraine becoming like East and West Germany, um, divided uh, down the middle, as, and, and that becomes the, what, the state of play for the next decade. Chris, thank you so much. You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Coming up, we'll be crossing live to Westminster where the Defence Select Committee will be discussing how the UK can work with NATO in response to Russian aggression. Now it's time to check, to check on the news headlines. It's 2.32. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. The UK has stepped up sanctions against Russia, banning all ships with any connection to the country from entering British ports. The Prime Minister has just arrived in Estonia after his meeting this morning with his counterpart in Poland. Boris Johnson says there's an unfolding disaster in Europe and President Putin has made a colossal mistake by invading Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is prepared to use barbaric and indiscriminate tactics against innocent civilians to bomb uh, tower blocks, to send missiles into tower blocks uh, to kill uh, children, uh, as we're seeing in increasing numbers. Ukraine is facing another day of heavy bombardment. The foreign ministry released this video showing a missile hitting a government building in Kharkiv. The interior ministry says at least 10 people have been killed in rocket attacks in the city today. 
Satellite images show a Russian military convoy stretching for an estimated 40 miles northwest of the capital, Kiev. Craters can also be seen at a military airbase and an oil terminal was damaged after being hit by Russian missiles. The chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court says he'll open an investigation into possible war crimes. Amnesty International says cluster bombs hit a nursery last week and Ukraine's ambassador to the US says Russia has used vacuum bombs. Both are banned under the Geneva Convention. In an address to the European Parliament, Ukraine's president accused Russia of targeting civilians. Nobody's going to break us. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. We want our children to live. It seems to me that is fair. Yesterday, 16 children died. And again, President Putin will say that this is an operation and we are beating the military infrastructure. Where are our children? What military factories do they work at? On which rockets? Maybe they ride in tanks. You're now up to date here on GB News. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Alex for We Need to Talk About. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Well, as reports talk of the progress of a 40-mile-long convoy of Russian heavy artillery and tanks making their way towards Ukraine's capital, and understand there have been reports in the last hour of alarm signaling potential imminent airborne attack, let's cross live to Kiev now to speak to Katerina Fedoteko, who's a TV host for Channel 24. Katerina, what is the situation like there? Hello, uh, I'm a TV host of the channel Ukraine 24. It's uh, uh, it's important, and uh, I would like to start with uh, the words "Glory to Ukraine," "Glory to Ukrainian people," and "Glory to armed forces of Ukraine." We'll stay strong, and we'll fight for our country. It's been just a few minutes since I came from the bomb shelter, where we all have to hide nowadays because. Russia is bombing us. They are bombing us every day, every night. And um, I want you to understand that we are fighting against the big country, Russia, against Putin and against his regime. So this is not a small country. And they have already told the world that uh, they are ready to use a nuclear weapon. And this is not a nightmare 
or a book, we are facing crazy dictator who wants to get Ukraine and then he will try to get the Europe. They are killing our civilian peoples. My friends today in Kharkiv, you know, this is one of the most uh, damaged, damaged city in Ukraine. They uh, were posting videos um, uh, where you can see uh, what Russian soldiers are doing with us. Damaged cities, crushed buildings and dead people on the streets, dead civilians. Yesterday morning, our president, he told that... Uh, he told the statistics that 16, 16, sorry, 16 children have died in Russia's war against Ukraine because they are soldiers. They are shooting medical buildings in Kyiv and not only in Kyiv. The war is all over the Ukraine. So this is our strong reality. But we are not give up. We are not going to give up. And uh, we have brave soldiers and we're going to fight till the last guest. Mm, Katarina, please and, don't go anywhere. I want to pick up this conversation uh, in the immediate future. At the moment, we've got to cross over to see US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who is addressing the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. As a defense of human rights, misappropriating terms that we reserve for the worst atrocities and disrespecting every victim of those crimes. Finally, we must press the Kremlin to respect the human rights of all Russians including the right of citizens to peacefully express dissent and journalists to report the news and provide information to the families of Russian soldiers who deserve to know the fate of loved ones killed in President Putin's war of choice. One can reasonably ask whether a UN member state that tries to take over another UN member state while committing horrific human rights abuses and causing massive humanitarian suffering should be allowed to remain on this council. Even as we focus on the crisis in Ukraine, it's far from the only part of the world where the Council's attention is needed. In Belarus, the Lukashenko regime is brutally repressing civil society and the country's pro-democracy movement, using transnational repression to silence critics abroad and enabling Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In recent days, Belarusian authorities have detained hundreds of people demonstrating peacefully against Russia's attack. In China, the government continues to commit genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang, against predominantly Muslim Uyghurs and other minority groups. We urge the High Commissioner to release without delay her report on the situation there. We must redouble our efforts to address the growing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and press the Taliban to respect the rights of all Afghans, including by stopping the unjust detentions of women protesters and journalists, ending reprisals, allowing all Afghans to be educated, and to work in every sector. The human rights crises in Burma, Cuba, the DPRK, Iran, Nicaragua, South Sudan, Syria, Venezuela, and Yemen, among others, also demand this Council's ongoing attention. In each of these places, we must not only denounce abuses, but work to stop them and hold perpetrators accountable. Yet, at a moment when the world needs both moral clarity and unity from this Council, some governments are arguing that sovereignty gives countries the right to do whatever they want within their border. It's no coincidence that many of the governments making this argument are systematically abusing human rights and have been eerily silent in the face of Russia's flagrant assault on Ukraine's sovereignty. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights begins with the word universal, because nations decided that there are certain rights that every person, everywhere, is entitled to enjoy. Members of this Council have a special responsibility to strengthen, not weaken, those rights. One way to do that is by welcoming scrutiny of our own record. In September, the United States issued a formal, standing invitation to all UN experts who report and advise on thematic human rights issues. We urge every Council member to take this step. We know we have work to do to advance human rights at home. Every member does. What matters is that we all hold ourselves to the same standards and work to address our shortcomings, as we are doing. Here's what else you can expect from the United States on this Council. First, we're committed to working with other countries, including those we don't always agree with, play, isn't it? to advance human rights as members have seen in their engagements with our permanent representative to the UN in Geneva, Ambassador Shiva Crocker, 
and our new ambassador to the Human Rights Council, Michelle Taylor. Second, we've heard repeatedly that the United States has often focused more on strengthening civil and political rights than we have on strengthening economic, social, and cultural rights. People around the world are looking to us to do both, and we hear that call. Third, we'll continue to counter anti-Israel bias and the unfair and disproportionate focus on Israel on the Council. The Commission of Inquiry and Standing Agenda Item 7 are a stain on the Council's credibility. We strongly reject them. Fourth, we'll keep fighting for the human rights of LGBTQI plus people, people with disabilities, members of racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, women and girls, and all marginalized populations and people in vulnerable situations. In recent days, people on every continent have come out to demonstrate against Russia's invasion and for the rights of Ukrainians. They understand that if we allow the rules of the international order to be flagrantly trampled anywhere, we weaken them everywhere. As an Estonian student protester put it, if Ukraine is not a country, then President Putin can say Estonia is not a country either. We stand for these rules not in opposition to any government, but rather because we see our shared interest in striving for a world where all people of all nations enjoy human rights and peace and security. And because history has shown us the darkness and suffering it comes when these rules are advanced. Well, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, there addressing the Human Rights Council, who are convening today in Geneva, focusing not only on Russian aggressions, but also mentioning recent crackdowns in Belarus as those protesting war in Ukraine are increasingly imprisoned as Lukashenko's regime also joins Russia in the war in Ukraine. And he said there, if we do not stand up for Ukraine's rights to be its own country, then Putin will make designs on countries such as Estonia too. Well, we can now go back to Katerina Fedoteko, who's a TV host for Channel 24 in Ukraine and joined us before we had to cross over there to Anthony Blinken. Katerina, I'm so glad you, um, you stayed with us. Uh, talk to me about media in Ukraine right now. How many, how many channels are continuing to be able to output and what sort of things are you telling to the people of Ukraine? Uh, it is really a hard situation uh, with uh, working during this condition, during this period of a war. But we work because we feel our responsibility, uh, because uh, people in our country, they need the information, because they are still scared. They are sitting in the shelters and they want to see what is happening, not only in their cities, but all over the Ukraine. And they want to see and to know what Russia, what Putin is doing with us. So we still work, but we are, um, we are very united. All of the TV channel, we have uh, united uh, on the one translation. So, for example, uh, we had the uh, Eter uh, this night, uh, four hours. And uh, next, another TV channel uh, got the... Estefet and they got the affair for another four hours. So we are helping each other. We are doing everything um, because it is our it is our job uh, to get the information and to show people what is really um, uh, what is really in our country is happening. But you know, we also have uh, a very um, a very big problem. I mean, Russia propaganda. They they are not telling truth. Our journalists, we are checking the information. We are going the, um, we are uh, getting the official information, and we doing everything that uh, doing everything for our people to know what is really happening. You, I just want you to, I just want to tell you the atmosphere which is in our cities. You know, um, as I said, uh, the enemy is roaming. Our territory both days and nights, but the worst situations are at night. So people, they are not even leave, they can't leave the bomb shelters because it is unsafe everywhere, every time. Women and children, they are sitting there and, uh, you know, it is really sad that a lot of women, they have to give birth to children in those and. Um, you know, 
because because it is really hard when when you have to when you know that your friends, your relatives, your husbands, and your um, parents or someone uh, they are in armed forces in Ukraine and they are fighting for our country and all we want, all I want, and all I am waiting right now for the text message from my friends who are in armed forces that they are alive. And this is really, really very hard. And I can't even, I couldn't even imagine that this would happen to my country. But I am really very proud of our people because even civilians, they come against the um, Russian soldiers with their bare hands, you know, and uh, our country is as much united as uh, it uh, has never been before. All uh, the armed forces, volunteers, journalists, politicians uh, have united against a common enemy, the Russian Federation and Putin himself, because he decided to declare the war on us and we will get strong. And we've seen incredible stories of citizen resistance in Ukraine. They're being broadcast around the world. But how vital uh, is using television news, for example, to convey public information, perhaps how to arm yourselves, where to shelter, how to recruit people into joining the effort? I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sure I understood your question yeah, correctly. I was, Katarina, I, I was asking you whether um, the news channels, you're talking about them coming together because they keep being taken off air, but how important are they in sharing to the general public information on where to hide, how to protect themselves, perhaps how to arm themselves, making Molotov cocktails? It, it is what we are doing every day at our... Uh, at tears, you know, because uh, people need this information. And uh, this night we have the, uh, we've been on air and I, I'm receiving lots of messages from people all over the Ukraine with uh, the words of support. And um, they tell us that they need us. They tell us that uh, they can get the information from us. And um, it is not that scary for them when they see us, when they see that we are in Kyiv, in uh, other, our cities, in Lviv, Kharkiv, and, uh, you know, all of our journalists, they are all over the Ukraine in each region, and um, they are as safe as they can be in these conditions, you know, but uh, uh, we are, we have to work in extremely uh, hard conditions right now because it is a war. Katarina, thank you so much for joining me today. Let's stay in touch. Keep safe and uh, let's catch up yes, again and, very and soon. If, if I can tell you that uh, we are really thankful to all of the British people who support us. We saw the huge protest actions in your country. Thank you for that. Uh, that uh, also makes us more powerful as well, that you help us. And we also appreciate the support of your government and of your prime minister that makes us stronger. Thank you. Katrina, it, it, it really is our duty to do that. The whole of the UK is with you. Please, please know that. Thank Katrina you. Fedoteko there, who's a TV host for Channel 24, doing an incredibly, incredibly brave job. Well, having heard Anthony Blinken addressing the UNHCR in Geneva, let's bring in Laurie Laird, who is a US political analyst. Laurie, I mean, the UK, back-to-back -back coverage of Ukraine, uh, it is the very first thing people are talking about when they see each other in the supermarket, when they catch up with friends. What about uh, in the US? Is there the same level of focus? I'd say there's a little bit less of a focus, almost by definition, America being such a big country. International affairs are not at the top of people's heads the way they are in Europe, where we have a, a, you know, a federation of smaller countries. Certainly attention on the coast, particularly in Washington, D.C., New York, the financial center. This is all anyone is talking about. But uh, further afield, it is much less of a focus. I agree with you. When I go out and about in London, it is all anyone one is speaking about the the out pouring of support for the Ukrainian people is utterly remarkable here. I say it's less of a, of, of a top of the head thought in much of America, but it, but it is. It's still the front page of, of every newspaper. It's the lead story on every newscast.
And in terms of the response to the actions that Biden has taken so far, I mean, he's come under a lot of criticism, perhaps for hesitancy. Uh, but does he have the backing of Republicans in his uh, in his actions against Russia at the moment? At the moment, I think so, but that's because U.S. troops haven't been committed to anything. We're not America is not putting troops anywhere near harm's way. I think where it could become dicey, and I'm getting ahead of things here, but if Vladimir Putin feels emboldened, if he is able to capture Kiev without too much loss of Russian life, does that embolden him further? Does that make him think, well, gosh, I'm going to I'm going to dip a toe in the water in a NATO country? Will he threaten the Baltics? in which case America will have to become very, very much more involved. The Baltic states have always felt threatened by Russia. They're also part of NATO. That, that will obligate America to act as the, the leading military in NATO. What happens then? I I'd be surprised if there is very much support politically or popularly for any kind of a more defensive role for American troops. Laurie, thank you ever so much for joining me today. That's Laurie Laird, who's an American political commentator. Now, finally, Christopher, going back to you, we've covered a lot today. I mean, it's, it's impossible to know what's going to happen next, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, the, 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 the big concern, I suppose, is if um, Ukraine falls, Putin then goes on to other, other NATO states, then we're into, world, into a world war. I mean, it, it is that dramatic and that, ex, that extreme at the moment. Right now, one of the options, Prime Minister, was what the PM was asked in, war, in, in Warsaw today. I thought that was so, so telling. And, he, and, you know, he's a guy who cares. He went to, he worshipped with the Ukrainians the weekend in the cathedral in London. Um, he does emote properly. He gets it. Uh, what the answer is, no one's sure. And that's why maybe a safe zone, it could be an idea, UN, UN enforced. But look at Putin. He's not one for listening at the moment. He's got his troops, his tanks bearing down on, on Kiev. The next few days are crucial and could be dreadful. Yeah, Christopher, thank you so, so much for joining me. And I'm sad to say it wasn't more positive news. That's all I've got time for today. I'll be back, of course, same time, same place tomorrow, two o'clock here on GB News. But do stay tuned because coming up next, it's The Briefing with Darren McCaffrey. But first of all, it's time for the weather forecast. <laughs> Dear Boris and dear members of the press, um, what this is, is quite an one? exercise and it shows how NATO and allies work together, even, even making such uh, visits happen. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you both in Estonia. Uh, I wish it could be under more pleasant circumstances. Uh, we are here because the security of Europe has changed dramatically. After a long and aggressive lead-up in Georgia, Crimea, Donbas, uh, last week all the masks came off and the whole world can now see. Putin has gone from an autocrat to an outright aggressor and Russia from a difficult neighbour to a rogue state. Putin has unleashed 200,000 soldiers against a free and sovereign country. Their targets, hospitals, schools, kindergartens, innocent Ukrainian lives. And we unfortunately expect to witness even more horrors, including indiscriminate bombings. We mourn all the lives lost in Putin's war. We are also seeing dangerous neglect of nuclear safety by Russian troops. We have just learned Lukashenko's troops have also entered uh, Ukraine. There is no doubt Belarus is a go-aggressor in this conflict. The whole international community must now stand up against the evil. Allies have been united against the aggression since the very beginning, and I'm very glad to say that. We have witnessed a fundamental change of policies across the democratic world, all in support of Ukraine, and aimed uh, in isolating the aggressor. Some of them seemed even unthinkable uh, a few days ago. NATO needs a forward defence strategy. Uh, NATO should be um, prepared to defend the most vulnerable part of NATO, which is the Baltic countries. And this includes on land um, establishing permanent increased forward presence, 
um, in air, establishing a credible uh, defence posture and a sense of urgency in developing uh, NATO's upgraded uh, defence uh, plan. At the same time, we need to continue our urgent support to Ukraine. Military aid is critical here. Estonia will continue with support as we provide significant military, financial and humanitarian aid. We cannot stop until we have stopped Putin. This is what we simply must do for ending the brutal violence and destruction and for helping the brave people of Ukraine. And Ukraine should be given a very clear signal to join the EU. The security of Ukraine is the security of Europe. Although uh, there is no direct military threat at our borders, NATO must take a leap now and adopt rapidly to the new security situation. We must move from forward presence to forward defence and from air policing to air defence. I welcome the decisions already uh, taken to strengthen the defence here. We are today in Tapa, uh, where we can witness the real collective efforts and commitment of NATO. I would like to thank the United Kingdom and all the allies who are already present here in Estonia and also sending additional troops uh, to Baltic region. We must work together to help Ukraine and to strengthen our own defence. Thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kaya. Thank you for your welcome. Great to see you, Jens, and uh, great to be here again in, in TAPA, uh, this very, very important mission. Uh, NATO is perhaps unique in the history of defensive alliances because it has stood for over 70 years, uh, not for aggression, but for peace and stability. And during those years, the alliance has been tested many times in the Cold War, in the Balkans, in Afghanistan. This matters because the world has become a more dangerous and a more contested place. A few short days ago, we all stood witness to scenes we hoped we would never see again on the continent of Europe. A sovereign, democratic people fighting for their lives against a foe who wishes to subjugate them by force. As we realise the terrible extent of President <coughs> Putin's ambitions, the world has been rightly united in praise for the valour and bravery of the Ukrainian people, led by President Volodymyr Zelensky. And uh, I expect, like uh, colleagues here, I've had the privilege of speaking to President Zelensky virtually every day since the Russian invasion, and I've heard firsthand his sheer determination that the freedom his people have experienced must never be snatched away. And indeed, it's clearer day by day from the way the uh, Ukrainians are responding that President Putin has made a disastrous miscalculation. His troops have not been welcomed into Ukraine as he prophesied and instead the Ukrainians have mounted an astonishing and tenacious resistance. We as the international community have a responsibility to do everything we can to help the Ukrainians in their efforts and that's why the UK has trained 22,000 members of the Ukrainian armed forces and why we've provided further defensive military support to Ukraine. And we have a responsibility to all uh, Ukrainians. That's why the UK has provided £140 million in humanitarian aid to Ukraine and to the region. It's why we've deployed both humanitarian experts and hundreds of military logistics experts to Ukraine's neighbours to help them shelter those seeking sanctuary on their shores. And it's why we've announced the first phase of a bespoke humanitarian route for the people of Ukraine to come to the UK. It's also why, alongside allies across the world, the UK has swiftly executed the biggest package of sanctions ever imposed against a G20 nation. And we've seen organisations from banks to oil companies to football leagues uh, to singing competitions who've made it clear that Vladimir Putin must be, and his regime must be isolated from the international community uh, for his actions. As we support the people of Ukraine, 
we must also shore up our shared resilience, both to protect our people and our values. These are nothing more than defensive measures, which have been the essence of NATO for more than 70 years. And I want to be crystal clear, finally, on that point. Uh, we will not fight Russian forces in Ukraine, and our reinforcements, like these reinforcements here in Tapa, are firmly within the borders of NATO members, and they are profoundly the right thing to do. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Secretary General Stoltenberg, please. Prime Minister Kallas, uh, Prime Minister Johnson, dear uh, Kaya and dear Boris, it's great to be with you here at uh, TAPA. It's great to be uh, back and uh, we are here to meet the soldiers uh, that are defending Estonia, our alliance and our values. These soldiers are keeping our nation safe and free and we owe them debt of uh, gratitude. Thank you to Estonia for hosting our battle group so well and uh, being such a staunch uh, NATO ally. And let me also thank the United Kingdom and you, Boris, uh, for leading this uh, NATO multinational battle group here at the Tapa base in Estonia and for doing so for the last uh, five years. And also for doubling your contribution over the last uh, few weeks with more British uh, troops uh, coming to Estonia. This really makes a huge difference and demonstrates NATO solidarity. We stand together uh, in this time of crisis. The people of Ukraine are fighting bravely against a brutal and unprovoked Russian invasion. We utterly condemn the Kremlin's war. Allies are imposing severe costs on Russia through sanctions. We are increasing NATO presence across the alliance to deter and to defend. And we are stepping up our support to help Ukraine defend itself. NATO allies are sending uh, Ukraine anti-tank weapons, air defense missiles and ammunition. Allies are also providing millions of euros worth of um, financial help and humanitarian aid. I commend Estonia and the United Kingdom for the assistance uh, uh, you are uh, providing to uh, Ukraine. Over the last weeks, in response to Russia's attack on Ukraine, we have increased our defensive presence in the air, on land and at sea with over 100 jets at high alert operating from 30 different locations and over 120 ships from the Baltic Sea to the Mediterranean. The UK, the US and other allies are deploying thousands more troops to the eastern part of the alliance. For the first time in our history, we are deploying the NATO response force. Because there must be no doubt, no room for miscalculation or misunderstanding, our commitment to Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is ironclad. We will protect and defend every inch of NATO territory. Credible deterrence prevents conflict and preserves peace. NATO is a defensive alliance. We do not seek conflict with Russia. Our message to President Putin is stop the war, pull out all your forces from Ukraine and engage in good faith in diplomatic efforts. The world stands with Ukraine in calling for peace. So uh, Kaya and Boris, it's great to be with you here again and we stand together in the alliance united in our condemnation of the Russian nation of Ukraine. Thank you. We are now at your disposal for questions. Please state your name and media organization you are representing and to whom the question is addressed to. Please use microphone, my colleague will assist. Hello, I am Katrin Arma from Estonian Television. I have a question to Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Um, your country has supported uh, volunteers who are ready to fight on the ground in uh, Ukraine. What do you think, under which circumstances should NATO get directly involved in fighting in Ukraine? Well, thank you very much. And uh, look, I'm going to 
be very clear about this because uh, you're, you're not quite right in what you say about supporting uh, volunteers going to fight on the ground. The UK is not uh, actively doing such a thing. Uh, but I, I understand, of course, uh, the feelings of people who feel emotionally engaged in this conflict. Because I cannot think of a time in international affairs when the difference between right and wrong, between good and bad, uh, uh, between a good and evil has been so obvious. And it is clear that the, the people of Ukraine have right on their side. And I can understand why people feel as they do. But we have uh, laws in our country about, uh, about uh, international conflicts and how they must be conducted. And uh, on, your, on your point, as, as both Kaira and Jens have, have stressed, uh, NATO is a, is a defensive alliance. Uh, I think for uh, any NATO member to get involved actively in uh, conflict with, with Russia is a very, very, uh, is a huge step which is not being contemplated by any member. And you would have to go to, uh, to parliaments and to, and to, uh, and to peoples uh, to get agreement for such, a, for such a step. That is not on the agenda. What is on the agenda is offering the humanitarian support uh, that we are, uh, offering the, uh, the logistical, the uh, defensive but lethal military support that, that we are and we're offering it in ever-growing uh, quantities, but also uh, the economic uh, pressure uh, that the West is now applying to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Putin regime. And I think it, it, one thing is clear. Uh, they, the, the Vladimir Putin miscalculated two things. He miscalculated the, the strength of the Ukrainian resistance, and he also uh, miscalculated and underestimated uh, the strength of Western unity and Western resolve uh, to ensure that, that Putin must fail. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Raghi Omar on behalf of uh, all British uh, broadcasters. There's a question to all three of you, actually. Um, Kharkiv city is under heavy bombardment. Um, the capital, Kiev, is being surrounded and has a column of heavy armour stretching somewhere between 25 and 30 miles towards it. Uh, do you think that given uh, the tactics being deployed by Russian forces uh, um, edging towards indiscriminate use of munitions in civilian areas means that given Russia's overwhelming uh, superiority that cities in Ukraine including the capital will inevitably fall and then one specific one for you Prime Minister Johnson um, the UN Security Council is at the heart of the system of global peace and security Britain like Russia is a permanent member do you think that you would support moves to suspend Russia from the UN Security Council Um, yes, um, what we are seeing in, in Ukraine uh, is, is uh, really uh, very horrifying uh, to see what, uh, what kind of steps they are taking and, and how they are uh, you know, escalating this uh, crisis. Um, the question whether the cities will, will fall, I think uh, uh, we underestimate uh, the Ukrainians' motivation and will to protect their, uh, protect their cities. Of course, we also know that uh, the forces are not really equal. Uh, so uh, one is to really conquer the cities and the other uh, one is to keep uh, keep those uh, cities under control. So I think there's going to be a lot of uh, resistance from Ukrainians and, and this even if, you know, temporarily uh, Russia takes hold of the cities, it's still very hard to keep and, uh, and as there is no support from the Ukrainian, Ukrainian side. So I think uh, what we have seen and the old Ukrainians have really uh, surprised everybody is, is by their motivation to fight for their country, to fight for their freedom. I think the same would be here because we have already lost our freedom once and we don't, we don't want to lose it a uh, second time. So I think, you know, all the nation is, is up to defend their country and uh, to take it uh, back even after, you know, building the resistance uh, in, in, uh, in the nation, really, to take those back. 
Yes, and just uh, Ra Raggy, on your, on your point about uh, what's happening in, in Kharkiv, it's, a, it's a absolutely sickening. And if it, remi it reminds me, if anything, if you remember the shelling of Sarajevo uh, market uh, by, uh, by the Serbs, it, the shelling of, uh, of innocent people in Bosnia, it has that feel to me of an atrocity uh, committed deliberately against uh, a civilian centre. And I think that, uh, coming to your, to your second point, uh, you know, Within the, the UN structures, it's very difficult to, uh, to move people uh, without a vote, and, and clearly, where you have uh, a majority, where you have a veto in the Security Council, you, you can't. Uh, there's a paradox: that we can't vote to change the, the rules without, a, uh, without the agreement of the, of the Russians. But what is happening is that uh, I think that the, the great middle of the, of the UN congregation, if you like, uh, is starting to realise quite how horrific this is. And with every day that goes by, as they, as they watch the heroism of the Ukrainian resistance, and they see what's happening in Ukraine, and they see uh, episodes like the, the shelling, uh, like the, the, uh, the missile in, in Kharkiv and the destruction of uh, civilian populations, I think people's stomachs are being turned uh, by what's happening. And they're, they're seeing that it is necessary to stand up uh, against Russian aggression uh, to support uh, the Ukrainians and, uh, and to endorse uh, our, our strategy, which is that President Putin must not be allowed to succeed. He must, he must fail in Ukraine. So what we now see is a new wave of attack against uh, Ukraine, against innocent uh, people, and a column of heavy Russian armor which is moving towards uh, Kiev uh, will bring more death. Uh, more suffering and more civilian casualties. And that's the reason why we need to continue to provide support to uh, Ukraine, uh, why we continue to call on Russia to stop this bloody war, and why we need to impose costs by the heavy sanctions on uh, Russia. And uh, uh, why we also should uh, uh, once again uh, commend uh, the bravery and the courage of the Ukrainian people, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces, and uh, also the Ukrainian President uh, Rodomir Zelensky. Um, this is horrifying, this is uh, totally unacceptable, and it's a blatant violation of international law. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Bilak, Telefi News. Uh, a question for question to Boris Johnson. Uh, by the middle of the March, the UK will have sent here about 2,000 troops. Uh, that's definitely a big uh, support for us, but uh, what would, happen, what would uh, have to happen uh, or what would be the trigger point for you uh, to double it or triple it or, or what's the limit? limit? Well, uh, th th thank, you thank you very much. We're, we're, we're very proud to be uh, working here with uh, our friends, uh, with, I think with our French friends, with our, our Danish uh, friends, uh, and of course with our wonderful uh, Estonian uh, hosts. And I, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we're, we're doubling it. Uh, it's a big commitment that we're, that we're making. Uh, I think that you know, we'll, uh, we'll always keep things under review. But what you can take it from me that our priority is uh, the safety, the security uh, of our friends and partners across the whole of the eastern uh, frontier of NATO. And uh, we're increasing our presence not just in Estonia, but in Poland, in the skies above Romania, uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, in the, in the Black Sea. Uh, the UK is, is beefing up uh, our presence in, uh, in, on NATO's eastern, uh, eastern flank. And uh, the, the message we need to get over, and I think we are collectively, all of us, uh, is that if Vladimir Putin thinks he's going to push NATO back uh, by what he's doing, he's, he's gravely mistaken. This will end up with, uh, with a fortified and strengthened uh, NATO uh, on, his, on, on his western uh, flank. Uh, he'll have more NATO, not less NATO. Thank you. Unfortunately, this is all the time we had. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. This Danish television. I, 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 go on. Something, something tells me this will, this will, you will have a brilliant question. Go yes, on. of course I will. You've doubled your number of troops here at the base in Kappa. Denmark is due to arrive next week. Yes. Would you like to see Denmark increase the number of troops here as well? 
I, all I can say is that I, uh, I, I had a, a great conversation with Meta, with your Prime Minister, uh, the other day. She was, she was fantastically uh, robust. I think she understands the problem uh, very well. I'm, I'm glad that Denmark is, uh, is increasing uh, its contribution. We work well with our Danish friends, and, uh, and uh, of course, it's always good that uh, uh, Denmark is, is contributing more. But I, I, I hesitate to, to go beyond that. Thank you very much. Thank you. That you got, based on the questions, Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. This morning, you got some tough questions from a Ukrainian reporter, and today, this afternoon, you're telling the crowd here, we as the international community have responsibility to do everything we can to help the Ukrainians in their efforts. So, are you actually doing that if you are not granting the request from Ukraine for a no-fly zone? Thank you, and, and I just want to get back to the to, and to, to the points that. Uh, Kaya and Jens and, and all of us have made uh, today. It is very, very important to understand uh, that uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. It's out, this, this is a time when miscalculation and misunderstanding is all too possible, and it's therefore crucial that we get that, uh, we get that message over. Uh, that does not mean uh, that we cannot help our friends, uh, or it does not mean that they do not have a right to self-defence, and we can help them in that self-defence, and that is what we are doing. When it comes to a no-fly zone, uh, which is, I think, what you asked, in the skies above uh, Ukraine, we have to accept the reality that that involves uh, shooting down uh, Russian planes, as I said in an answer to, I think, the first question. Uh, th that's a very, very big step. It is simply not on uh, the agenda of any NATO country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the press conference. Thank you for following. Uh, there we go. That was the end, uh, rather chaotic end, it must be said, uh, to that press conference at the Tapper military base in Estonia, where Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, is visiting uh, troops, British troops, alongside Jens Stoltenberg, uh, the NATO Secretary General, and Kaya Kallas, who is the Estonian uh, Prime Minister. I say a chaotic end because the questions seem to have ended, uh, and yet, the, again, that question having been ambushed. Uh, essentially in Poland and now in Estonia, about the possibility of a no-fly zone, uh, the Prime Minister insisting uh, that is not something uh, that NATO member states are uh, looking at. Uh, the Prime Minister also repeating time and time again alongside uh, the NATO Secretary-General Jens Stoltenberg uh, that the UK uh, will not militarily be engaging uh, directly in Ukraine. He said we will not fight Russian forces in Ukraine and that uh, NATO uh, NATO's eastern flank will remain firmly within the border of NATO members. One other really interesting thing I thought that came from that press conference uh, was that uh, Boris Johnson uh, says the UK is not supporting volunteers going to fight in Ukraine. Uh, directly, it must be said, contradicting what Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, had suggested on uh, Sunday. He says uh, that the UK is not uh, doing that, uh, a sign that he does not want, essentially, uh, Brits to go off to fight on behalf of the Ukrainians. OK, it is 21 minutes past uh, 3 o'clock. You're watching uh, GB News. This is The Briefing with me, Darren McCaffrey. We have got continuous coverage between now and 4 o'clock. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for your company on this Tuesday afternoon on your TV, online and on your radio. As I say, continue coverage of the situation in Ukraine with various guests between now and four. Let's first of all go to our Home Affairs and Security Editor, uh, Mark White, who joined us. Uh, Mark, uh, just on that point, uh, I mean, it couldn't be clearer, uh, and, and uh, as perhaps it is unsurprising, but clearly both the Prime Minister and Jens Stoltenberg wanted to send that message uh, that Britain, NATO, is not directly going to get involved in this war. Yes, and putting boots on the ground, they've clearly said uh, over recent days there is no way that, uh, in fact, recent weeks, they've said that they wouldn't put boots on the ground to go to Ukraine's direct events like that because it would lead to a direct confrontation with a nuclear armed state. And a, a no-fly zone, I'm afraid, as laudable as that might sound in terms of protect, protecting uh, those hordes of people who are heading towards safer territory in neighbouring Baltic states, uh, it would also put them on a direct